but with Facebook or any community for that matter, no matter how you build it, I think you got to own it one way or another. Today, we had on Matt LaMarche, an Atlanta real estate agent whose business exploded once he joined and then started his own Porsche Facebook group. He talks about the importance of posting content around your passions and how agents can find and start their own community. The Broke Agent presents Over Ask Podcast. Well, here we are, Mr. Matt LaMarche. On the program, Matt, we met in Clubhouse. We did. We not sure in did. a club, not in a Clubhouse, <laughs> in the Clubhouse app. Right. I think that's where Eric. We all met. Well, we yeah. all met you there. Yeah. How, how could I forget Matt's radio esque voice, <laughs> his professional delivery? You'll hear it on this podcast. But the guy's got quite a sophistication about him when he speaks. Yeah. Uh, yeah well i'll take that (laughs) you kind of you sound like a like a football quarterback or something like a Uh, peyton manning type of mm. not like Peyton Manning, but it sounds like you could really you know your way around a football field you know your way around a huddle i mean (laughs) a huddle yeah for sure uh no you know i didn't so growing up i was a musician and you know you just become a little more sensitive to sounds i think and and recognizing uh opportunity for improvement And I love to sing, but I never sing for anyone ever. Um, I'll give you guys a couple bars later, but yeah, please. um, But uh, but no, I just uh, I don't know. Uh, Honestly, I think Clubhouse and podcasting, like listening to voices, is is uh, especially interesting, Uh, and that's why I love Clubhouse. Um, It's not nearly what it was, but um, wait, 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 love or love? Loved. Oh my God, (laughs) Matt. Matt, Matt Leonetti, we, we're going to have to get into this. If Matt, you are still on Clubhouse, there might be something wrong going on here. Why, why are you, why are you still on this app? Uh, honestly, it's just a bunch of relationships. It's not really what it used to be for me. It's changed quite a bit. Um, you know, there's still great rooms and great learning environments and spaces that take place. But honestly, uh, you know, once you've introduced yourself to a number of people. You know, there's only so many relationships we can all manage at any given time. And uh, the app started kind of just plateauing in growth. And that to me was like, all right, well, we're not going to dump a ton of time into this. And we have other platforms going on and other media going on, uh, but also just other things I wanted to do within the industry. So we're still there, not nearly as much as we used to be. Um, Yeah. But uh, it's definitely changed. It certainly was good for relationships. Don't worry, folks. We did not bring Matt on here to talk about uh, Clubhouse. <laughs> yeah, this is a 2020. <laughs> yeah, right. Those were great episodes, though. <laughs> yeah, they were. I mean, yeah, this is not 2020. But what we did bring you on uh, to talk about, Matt, uh, we've had no one really talk about this. And I find it super interesting how you get a lot of business now um, through kind of Porsche, Porsche. What, which one is it? If you're German, they're going to say Porsche. But if okay. you're American or anywhere else, they're going to say a lot of different things. But okay, however so this you is, say, it's fine. Okay, cool. This is very cool and intriguing. I think a lot of people are going to find a lot of value in this episode. So you've pretty much did you build a community around Porsches? You're super passionate about Porsche, and that's like your hobby, your love. Did you build a community around that, or are you just a part of a community and go to meets and and stuff like that? So kind of a mix but honestly i got into porsches before real estate so i just want to make that delineation first and foremost that yeah you don't get into real estate and then get into porsches i mean some people right. do but uh but for me at least it was always like a passion i loved cars growing up and stuff uh there was another community of porsche people owners enthusiasts racers stuff that i was part of uh but there wasn't really anything that fit what i was looking for it was a cool enough group and they did some cool events and stuff but for me I wanted something that kind of scratched my itch. I love to drive. I love to be around these cars. And as a product of that, I liked being around the people that also had these cars. Um, And, you know, there's a lot of uh, stereotypes that you could probably imagine around the exotic car world. (laughs) Um, But to be honest, Porsches are a little bit different. And our group looks like any guys from their like mid twenties and girls, mid twenties up to like mid fifties and beyond. But there was another group I was a part of, and I saw some things that I was like, eh, I mean, it's good, but it's not great. It could be a lot better. And I went and did something on our on our own 
that I was like, this to me is like what I want. And lo and behold, a lot of people came along with it to the point now that we have about 2,300 members or so in our Facebook group. And we have an email list that goes out and, you know, we get events and we go to different breweries and stuff and we do different drives. So uh, it kind of started out with another group, but then we kind of merged it into our own little uh, ecosystem, if you will. Are these local, uh, are all local people that are in, in this group? Like, do you meet up uh, as well and like do that? And then how does that translate into the business side of things? Yeah, for sure. And great question. So the name of the group is Atlanta Porsche Enthusiasts. It's a private group. Um, we do have a couple questions and you guys know how Facebook groups work, but we generally try to keep it local because we do want people to build relationships. We do want business to happen as a result of this, not just in real estate, but for anyone and everyone, there's a ton of small business owners and entrepreneurs, as you can imagine, are in that group. So we do a lot of local events. We go to race days. There's a couple of racetracks in Atlanta here that we go to uh, on different you know, major track events and stuff. And then we also have track days where we sponsor the day and people can take their cars out on the track, which to me is where these cars are really most enjoyable. <laughs> you can't really yeah. drive down 75 or 85 here in Atlanta uh, and a 911 with 500 horsepower, that's, um, you know, a lot of fun. A lot of traffic gets in the way. Um, even, right. Even in the left lane where we like to uh, exaggerate speed a little bit. Okay, nice. So how does this how does this work? But like, is this where you get all your business now? Just these Porsche people? Like these <laughs> maniacs who buy 7,000 Porsches and then you just figure they can afford a house too? It's a How's good clientele. Work? I mean, you're <laughs> yeah. not going to do a Honda Civic community. No, 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 no. These are not Toyota Camrys. These are not Honda Civics. <laughs> uh, they are, generally speaking, you know, nicer and, and more expensive cars, which you can make your own assumptions about their, their uh, clientele there. But uh, yeah, for me, it really didn't start that way. And even now, I when I go to an event or when I organize a drive or whatever, my goal isn't business. I'm not trying. I just, I enjoy this stuff. And you can probably tell I get a little more passionate and jazzed up when we're talking about cars than an inspection I just got back from. <laughs> right. So to me, I don't organize this stuff and it never intended to start that way. It just naturally and organically kind of came along. Walk us through the process of building this community. So you got the idea in your head from other communities that you were involved in. What was your next step in terms of collecting the members, starting the Facebook group, and actually getting them digitized and in person to meet up with you? Yeah. So again, that other group was great. It was a smaller group than ours, but they were really, really, really engaged. And they would have two or three months, two or three events per month. And after being really involved with that group and seeing the things that I wanted to change but couldn't. I was like, I'll just go create my own thing. And a lot of those people came with me because they wanted something different. They wanted something else. Um, and they kind of fit, you know, what they were looking to get out of these cars and this community and everything. Um, but we started the Facebook group and then it just started spreading. And I would go to different car events around Atlanta, some of them Porsche specific, some of them just, you know, a drive on a Saturday afternoon. And I was like, yeah, I built this group over here of people that are really passionate about these cars and about you know, connecting with people like them that are into these cars and love to drive and love to be on the track and, you know, want to share a beer with with a guy that has the same car they do or something totally different. Um, and so we really just started growing that way. And of course, one person tells 100 people and then, you know, the next thing you've got 2,300 people uh, to, to manage here. What, what? What, does, what does a lead look like coming through from something like this? So I know this isn't your sole objective is to get leads but like what does that look like um like when someone wants to buy it how do they approach you with that yeah so i mean like in 2022 i i did what 15 deals and probably four of those were from this group um so you know it's roughly a third ish of my business that comes through this group at this point um and honestly back to eric's question as far as the like where it started you know, when you start a Facebook group, especially, you're trying to get content. You're trying to get regular postings out there and get people engaged in dialogue when they're not on the drive and when they're not out taking pictures of their car and stuff. And so, you know, I really encourage that. And from the get, I was like, I'm going to have to post once a day on here about the newest Porsche coming out or, uh, you know, the million mile 911 or whatever, just to kind of get the conversation started. And then I started encouraging some of my, I call them ambassadors. There's like 10 guys that really helped me moderate and administrate this group. 
and they're creating conversations. They're talking about new products and new wheels and new tires and new engine mo modifications. And some of them have unbelievable YouTube channels that they share content to as well uh, into the group. And so it really gets, it kind of just starts organically. I mean, we're out on a drive and I'll be sitting down at lunch with 20 or 30 or 50 other people and real estate naturally comes up. And, uh, you know, they all know that I'm in real estate, so I don't hide it by any stretch. But more often than not, I'm the one telling them, look, I'm really just here for the cars and the experience at this point. Can we talk about this tomorrow on Monday on next weekend, whatever? Because to me, the reason I started this wasn't for lead gen. It just came that way. <laughs> and so the conversation is very easy. You know, we have a shared passion. There's a common denominator in the cars. Um, and whether they have, you know, a $10,000 Boxster or a $500,000 GT2 RS or something, there's a lot of cars and a lot of different levels in between those that we have the one common passion. And so, you know, when you're doing something like this, and I don't get paid for doing this group, there's no sponsorships, there's literally, this is just a Facebook group I threw together and we started doing events and stuff. And it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort to put together drives and events and all this stuff. And, uh, and people just really appreciate it. I mean, every single drive we do, every single lunch we do, um, anytime we go to the track, people are just like, thank you so much for doing this. And honestly, that's thanks enough, but it just happens that people come through and they're like, look, we're looking at some investment property or we're looking to upsize or we want to move areas or school districts. And then, you know, they actually get disappointed when I don't show up for showings in a Porsche, which is like <laughs> kind of crazy. <laughs> what do you show up in? Uh, so my daily driver is an Audi Q7, super boring, uh, Cla by comparison. Classic. But, yeah. but now, you know, lenders and inspectors and everything are like, where's the Porsche? Where yeah, you didn't it. bring it. And it's like, yeah, well, you're the Porsche guy. <laughs> well, and <laughs> I'll take it. Right. Like it's not, again, that's why we had a Camry club where <laughs> you're just yeah. hoping they, they could get pre-qualified. <laughs> so yeah, people ask when me you start about this my Facebook Subaru group, all the time too. When you start this Facebook group, I, I think it's super important. Uh, a point you mentioned earlier about how you had to be the one posting nonstop. You had to be the one to foster that community. And when we started our discord, we started a Facebook group called top producers. I don't think we posted it in it in two years, Matt, but <laughs> it, it is so incumbent upon the person who starts that group to keep that community going and keep those posts going. So anyone who's thinking of doing a Facebook group in a specific niche, you do have to understand that will become your second content strategy outside of your actual real estate business is keeping this community alive, trying to come up with engaging questions. So were you just looking at pictures of Porsches to post? I know you said when new cars come out, but that can't be every single day, right? So what sort of conversations were you trying to drive in this group? Honestly, just like anything and everything, you know, you got to just throw everything at the wall. And so, you know, if I saw an interesting car for sale, I would post that. If I saw an interesting paint job, I would post that. Um, if I saw, you know, something that was, in, in Porsche world, there's the purists that love how it came from Germany, the way that it was designed, the engineering, they don't change a thing. They have the original tires that, you know, they're now remanufacturing for these cars. And then there's another group of us that personalize is the best way to explain it. Our cars with wheels and tires and, you know, paint and body kits and engine in uh, intakes and, you know, modifications, all that stuff. So for me, it was like, let's just see what hits a note. And so, you know, you'd post for a week, seven or eight posts a, a single week, and then look at the analytics and go, okay, man, this one did really well. And to me, the enthusiast component of it was really important because before I got into the cars and before I could afford to even buy one, I was just that. I was just an enthusiast. I always wanted one. And it was just a matter of how do I get my hands on one? And I knew that a lot of other people were like that. And a lot of the people that are in the group may not have a Porsche yet, but they want one. And so they're able to go in there and now ask a ton of questions about what years do I avoid? What years should I be looking at? Is there any modifications that we should, you know, absolutely not consider? Or are there things that are okay as long as we got service records and a history, you know, all these normal types of things. So in the beginning, it was just like, just throw it all out there and see what happens. Um, and now that it's all user generated, my only rule is be courteous and don't be a jerk, basically. So if someone has a particular color or a particular car or did something to their car, like, don't be that guy. Don't be the one guy out of 2300 that like, 
has to pick apart every little thing on a car because you know that's someone's baby that's someone's like representation of you know what they wanted out of their car so that's my only rule but now they understand they get it and and it's all user generated at this point that sounds a lot similar i'm in a lot of watch groups i love watches Hmm. um sounds the same thing there's like the purest and like you know you don't want anything that's like you don't even want to like polish the watch (laughs) a lot of the purest because it needs to be exactly how it was from the factory Mm -hmm. Um, so that's interesting. Now these, these deals you did do from this, uh, this group and community, are they like, you know, what are we talking here in price? Is there like a noticeable difference in your price range? Um, I don't know. Like do Porsche people, like, I don't, uh, are you guys rich as fuck? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, that's the thing I think that keeps a lot of people out of the brand, honestly, is that you can go get a $10,000 Boxster and it's a mid-engine car. It's a great car. It handles really, 10, really well. 10000 Yeah. Yeah. Where? On the used market. Do, where do I get that? I just I was just looking at one yesterday because I have this <laughs> this problem with looking at cars that I'll never ever buy. But okay. when I when I have conversations like this, it's like it's not that hard. There are ten thousand dollar cars out there now. They might have one hundred and sixty thousand miles on them. They may be ragged, but you can get into one now. The bulk of people are going to look in the fifty to one hundred thousand dollar range. But as that translates to real estate, I mean. I've had investment properties that we've sold for 300, 350, 400,000 up to uh, a buyer that I helped last year, at like 1.25. Um, and there's a guy, I'm also licensed in South Carolina, but there's a guy there that has a seven and a half million dollar house with a seven car garage. And he probably has, gosh, three or four hundred thousand dollars in Porsches alone. So, you know, I think. To me, it's not how do you approach one versus the other because you never know. One could be coming for an investment at three hundred, and the other could be coming for their primary at a million and two to seven and a half million dollars. What would you say to an agent who is not into Porsches? Maybe they're into, I don't know, the video game Wave Race on N sixty four. You know that game, Matt? <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know that game, other I Matt? Do. I do. Okay. <laughs> yes. So say I'm a big Wave Race guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to start a community. What's the first move that I make? Do I infiltrate other wave race communities? Because it sounds like you infiltrated this Porsche community and then peeled apart some of their their members. Is that the, the best way to search on Facebook, wave race communities? Like, how, how would I go about doing this? <laughs> sounds, yeah. sounds very personal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I, before you get into your answer, I am the best wave race player, I think, in the world at oh, really? this very moment. Wow. I'm playing it on a consistent basis, and I don't think... <laughs> I was trying to like break it down. Is there anyone in the apartment complex better than me? No. Mm, Is there anyone in Brentwood better than me? (laughs) No. LA? Probably not. America? You know? So. Well, I'll take a whack at it. Yeah. Okay. Just beat me first try. All right. So I'm a realtor. I like baseball. I like the Yankees. I want to start a community or I want to, you know, become well known in one of these communities. What do I do? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think you start out with a lot of research. Um, for me, there was a core group there that just wasn't being satisfied. And it was like, okay, well, I think there's something here. Let's go recreate it. So it was in a way done for me. It was just done in a different platform. So I took it to Facebook, but with Facebook or any community for that matter, no matter how you build it, I think you got to own it one way or another. So if Facebook disappears tomorrow, I still have email addresses. I still have phone numbers that if I want to put a drive together, it's no problem. Um, so that would be the first thing. But the second thing would be the research component of this is really important because if there's, whether it's wave race or baseball or a particular team, I think there's community built around all of that stuff and how many people are attracted to that particular niche topic, subject, team, whatever, uh, is going to determine your ultimate, you know, outcome. So if there's 40 people in your building and 40 of them are into wave race, those are pretty good odds. Or, it's a psychotic building, I'll tell you that. <laughs> that would looks, be a very strange building. <laughs> but to me, like those types of passionate individuals that are connected in a different way than just your neighbor or just real estate people that you might or might not trans- transact with at some point, you've got an active and captive audience. And if you can find more people that fit the need, I mean, there's probably nine agents, nine other agents in my group. And I'm okay with that because I'm the one that runs the group. And if there's ever a question about who owns this thing, 
it's 100% crystal clear. But uh, whether it's geography that you're trying to attract, uh, like in a geographic farm, or if it's a passionate group of a team, you know, fanatics, whatever, to me, you got to do some research on the front end because a lot of these people started a group and then they did nothing with it. And now it's basically, you know, vacant, right? What was so unsatisfying about that other Porsche group? I, I picture just a bunch of angry drivers in the comments, just like, what's going on? They're not organizing drives for us. They're not posting pictures of paint jobs. Like, what the hell? What were they all so upset about? Well, so to me, the biggest problem with that group and what I heard from a lot of other people was they were doing things that were kind of old school and they weren't doing things that brought the new generation of owners out, which the, was me. The I'm, purists. Well, some. But some that also, you know, when I pull up in my highly modified 911 Turbo, I don't want to be criticized. I don't want to be ridiculed because I did something to my car. Um, and so that was a lot of the like, there was like these little clicks and little groups and stuff. And it was very unapproachable is the best way to explain it. And ours with our ambassadors, especially when they see people they don't know, they go up, they introduce themselves. They introduce them to me. They introduce them to someone that owns the car just like them. You know, they really make it informal, but also inviting. And to me, that's what was kind of missing. Um, you know, this brand has a very, even at the corporate level, a very hard time getting people into the brand because of the snootiness and the stereotypes that kind of come along with it. But, you know, we've done charity drives. We've done uh, events where we stocked a pantry here in my city of Sandy Springs and brought in 600 you know, pounds of food for a charity. Like these are really good people. And you know, those are the types of people that I wanna be doing business with, but they're also the people I wanna be hanging out with outside of work. And so to me, the biggest problem was it was unapproachable. It wasn't a fun environment. It was always very like uptight and I don't know, corporate, if that makes sense. <laughs> Everyone stop for a second. This market is a little bit tighter than it has been in the past few years, which means leads are not necessarily banging down the door. But you know who isn't worried right now? Agents who use Boomtown, the number one rated real estate CRM in the game. That's right. Boomtown it was actually founded in 2008, Eric. Do you know that? Yeah, the same year the Phillies won the World Series against the Rays. How could I forget? I'll take your word for it. Uh, in the middle of a housing crisis, their CEO, Greer Allen, built it yeah. from the ground up with Legend. the explicit intention of empowering agents to be successful no matter the market. So if you're ready to build a truly bulletproof business, visit boomtownroi.com slash overass. Plus, see how you can score 750 big ones in free digital advertising. That's boomtownroi.com slash overass. Yeah. I feel like for, like for something you're literally just passionate, you would be doing anyways to get four deals from it is pretty badass. Like you're, you're making money just to do something you like to do. Yeah. Like that's, that's pretty cool. And that's part of your business. So I, I feel like that's going to continue to grow so much for you, like as, as your community grows. So that's really cool. I also notice, and we'll pivot a little bit here. You're in a lot, like every time I see in like a Facebook group of agents, um, I see like, you know, I need a great Atlanta agent. Your name always pops up. Like it always pops more than once. And is that like, are you trying to network with a lot of agents as well? Like, are you getting a lot of agent referrals now mm -hmm. as well? Yeah. Yeah, we definitely are. And I appreciate that as well, because that's one thing in 2022 I was really focused on. And Clubhouse was a little piece of that, but I had to figure out how to take those offline, uh, those online relationships offline. And that's when I started connecting with more people on Instagram and Facebook and in LinkedIn and, you know, all these other platforms, because I was like, if Clubhouse disappears, I don't have any contact information for any of these people. So, and I actually posted about it yesterday that I created a Google form. If you want to be on my referral network, you know, here's how you do it. You fill out the form and then I got a map and we got the whole thing set up. And now when I've got a referral that's coming to your area, Porsche owner or otherwise, I can click on the map, see who serves that area, call them up and say, hey, I got a referral from you for you. And it makes the process a lot simpler um, but we do a ton of video content as well. So there's behind the scenes content where it's super specific to buyers and sellers and investors and whether they're looking to buy, sell or invest, they each get different content, but that's a huge piece of it. 
like they love me, they want to do business with me, but they're moving somewhere. I got to find someone that treats the business the same way that I would. And so I've been through a ton of vetting and I do phone interviews with, with my other referral partners. Um, but I also have a really good system in place. And, you know, the coaching component of that is that there was no system before this. And I told my coach, I want to really work on this. And she started plugging in all these systems for me. And then we started working on them. And of course, you got to maintain them. You got to keep them up. But um, the fact that anyone puts my name out there is amazing. I mean, I've worked really, really hard on that part. But I also think they get a chance to connect with me on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. And they see how consistent we are across all channels. And they're like, man, if he can put out consistent content like this, he'll probably do a great job in the real estate transaction as well. It's all a slow build up, you know, you being on Clubhouse, Facebook, Instagram, when I started the broke agent brand, just being omnipresent on all these platforms, no matter how big or small my following was at the time, that name recognition starts to be engraved and ingrained in people's heads. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't have a following, but you're just making noise in these Facebook groups by popping up and by having these conversations, your brand is still being built, even if it's not tied to an actual number. Um, I, I also want to get into what you're doing with your Porsche content on your Instagram feed or Facebook feed. Are you implementing a lot of your your hobbies, your uh, Porsche obsession to Instagram to kind of combat the real estate content or, or what does that look like for you? Yeah. So I'm like one of the only real estate agents that doesn't post about real estate as much as I probably should. <laughs> right. But I feel like it's a better sell when you're buying from me. You're not buying uh, the real estate content. And and that's why I say agents get disappointed, inspectors get disappointed, even clients get upset when I don't show up in the cars that I show. And, you know, for me, that's, that is a strong indicator that I, w I really wanted people to focus on Matt LaMarche, Atlanta Real Estate, and Porsches. If they could make those three connections, we were good. They knew everything about me they needed to know. Obviously, I'm a husband and a father and, you know, everything that all else. Comes, that all comes after. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But honestly, like they're really strong pillars, right? And so for me, the, the Porsche content generally does pretty well. Now, it's a super saturated space um, on any platform, I think. But Instagram is very, very good at delivering you the type of content you want to see. And, uh, and now, like the thing that really warms my heart the most is that the people that only know those three things and nothing else about me, they don't follow stories or lives or anything else, is that they'll send me a Porsche reel that they get once. And the moment that you do that, your feed is just going to be full of Porsches because that's how the algorithm works. It's you're sharing this content, you're expanding the reach of that particular creator. And, uh, and yeah, we use a ton of Porsche stuff in our content and I use it to attract business all the time. hundred mm percent. -hmm. What I think is so great about what you do is, um, like you post about these things, but it, it never comes across as like, douchey hmm. um like you can tell you're actually passionate about it and you're not just trying to show off hmm. which i think is awesome because i mean in this industry especially there's a lot of like people who just want to show off their nice things to the point where i think people are almost hesitant i i know some of my friends are hesitant to share maybe uh their new watch that they love and they've been you know like saving for and they've been researching or their new car because they don't want to be put in that category mm -hmm. um how do you think you get around that how do you think is it just because you're super passionate about it you don't like when you post it's not like to me it's not like you're saying look at how much money i have i have a porsche it's i love this car like how do you how do you do that <sighs> Honestly, I think it's just repetition. You know, if if it's staged, if it's edited, if it's uh, only showing, you know, I, I talk a lot about, especially on stories, like what's going wrong? Because I think it's super important for us to be transparent and authentic to our audience and to the people that are eventually going to work with us too. And I think by showing that, their their guard comes down. You know, there's not this facade of everything's peachy and Matt's out whipping around in his Porsche and selling homes left and right. It's not easy <laughs> to do what we do over and over and over and again, year after year. And so to me, and I appreciate the compliment and I'll take it as a compliment because I think a lot of people have this idea about what Porsche ownership or what Porsche owners are like. 
And they're not all that way. Just like Lamborghini, just like Ferrari. Like I know a lot of these guys and a lot of these different brands, they're not all like that. It's just like every stereotype about real estate agents, you know, we're not all like that. Um, and to me, it's not about showing off. Like I don't give two rips about what anyone thinks about my car, much less the person that I pull up next to at the stoplight that I, I'll never meet, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that repetition of just not caring, number one, but number two, it, I mean, again, I just, I get passionate about it. I get fired up when you ask me about it. So it's super easy for me to get passionate about. And it's not just like the last couple of years, as long as I've been in real estate, I had a poster on my wall when I was a kid of these cars. I'm like, I, I just asked my parents, I was like, how do I get that car? And they're like, work really, really hard. <laughs> I think they kind of thought this is like, this is way out there. Um, but that, that was all the motivation I needed. And, and I think when you do this day in and day out with content, especially like, of course, there are people that fake it and that, you know, are going to put up a facade. But for me, that car could disappear tomorrow. And yeah, it would suck. But like, I still have my help. I still have my wife, my kids, a beautiful house. Like, what Club am I house really? You still have. I still have Clubhouse. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, like the cars are just a piece of who I am and it, it doesn't define me necessarily, but I really enjoy them. And I think a lot yeah. of people are like that. You know, they have their own passions. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's awesome to have, like, for it to all come and like you had that poster on your wall and now it's, you know, you, you've made that a reality. Eric had Lola Bunny from Space Jam on his wall. Hell yeah, I, I did. Yeah. She was so, ace. Next to the wave race. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Wave race next promotion. Made <laughs> a little wave race look up at the poster. I mean, people forget until they completely destroyed her attractiveness in the last Space Jam. Lola Bunny was the ultimate hot bunny growing up and i will I mean, she I will was fight the, anyone who disagrees she's, she's the hottest bunny on the scene i mean there's, there's no there's one some, some hot avatars too i don't know if you've seen avatar but throw <laughs> it on insane. it's only three and a half hours long matt if you had to start the other matt matt leonetti if you had to start a facebook group in a specific niche what would you start in it would definitely be either watches uh specifically Rolex because I love them or music. Yeah. But well, yeah, I, I'd probably go watches. I'm just, I'm just love watches. I have books behind me on watches. There's watch boxes up there. I, I get like you, Matt, very fired up when we talk about watches and I don't care to like, you know, really show them on, it's not really my, my thing to, I don't know. I, I feel like it's weird to like show my watch or like, you know, when they do like, uh, they're like just got a uh, an offer signed, and they like the watch is like just just in, you know, yeah. or the steering wheel, you know. I'm not into that shit. Yeah. You know what's funny is I remember being at I think it was an Inman conference in 2015, 2016, and the the idea of posting about what you're interested in and your hobby was so revolutionary back then because all agents used to post was content specifically about real estate. And someone went up there and was just like, oh, post about your hobbies. If you like horseback riding, do that. If you like skydiving, or like, you know, Matt, you and I have used these examples a few times. Yeah. And it's, I feel like we've also gotten away from that again, almost, because now you have all these talking heads saying, make reels, do market updates, do green screen videos, do uh, trending audios, that type of thing. That they've almost forgot just go back to posting what you're interested in as well. And you're still going to attract the right people. So as simple as a concept as it is going back to it and highlighting it, especially in this episode, I think is important. So yeah. what I'm saying is we're geniuses for talking about. This. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I do think like, I think people overthink everything. Just do what you want to do. Like what I always say is what type of service would I want? What type of commercial would I want to see? And that's what I try and do. You're never going to win over everybody. So just, you know, do what you would do. You're going to attract like-minded people that way. And then just go for it. Don't overthink, you know, oh, if I post about my horseback riding, you know, if you post about, hor about horseback riding and someone else doesn't like horseback riding, doesn't mean you lost the listing. <laughs> it's just... Just, I don't know anyone know. who doesn't like horseback riding. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do it. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know anyone who's against it. You know, Nate, my wife Nikki's a little scared of horses. Thinks they're a little evil. 
totally understandable. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, horses, <laughs> I remember I went on a field trip, I think in fifth grade and I saw horses, horses have 20 inch penises and okay. there's like, you All know, right. multicolored swatting weight flies and everything like that. And it, that definitely intimidated right. me a little bit. Matt, what's your take on horses? <laughs> oh, they're like um, dogs with mohawks. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my wife uh, was going to become a vet, but her junior year, uh, and she used to do equestrian competitions and stuff. So she was around horses all the time and she became deathly allergic to horses oh, wow. in her junior year. So that's like a big part. So you ask like who doesn't like horseback riding? There we Probably go. The, yeah. The people over in the corner sneezing their heads right. off. Um, I, you, <laughs> I, I thought you were going to say she got like bucked in the face or something. Oh no, like... dude, it is super dangerous. It's yeah. super dangerous. And you know, when you're competing, especially like you spend so much time just like anything else on these crafts and yeah, it is super dangerous. Even her dad was like, you know, this is, I don't know what we were thinking, putting you on the back of a horse as right. you know, a 12 and 13, 14 year old girl, but yeah. Um, so anyway, I, she, she obviously used to spend <laughs> a lot of time around them now can't, but uh, right. she's the only one that, that I would say can't, can't enjoy. I mean, I'd argue sure. it's a, I'd argue it's a step away from a UFC fighter. <laughs> yeah. It's scary. So I retract my horseback comment uh, from before about people disliking it. If you like horseback riding, <laughs> drop a comment yeah. in YouTube below. We are very interested. Comment horseback, right? But my point is, is if you post about something you like, unless it's super we like if it's maybe like your political views or something like that, mm -hmm. That's one thing. But if you post about, you know, if I post about my watch, if someone doesn't like watches, that doesn't mean they'll never work with me. Hmm. But the people who do like watches, that's like one thing, one extra thing that you can relate with them that maybe another agent wouldn't. 100%. 100%. And you know what the point. I also appreciate you saying you could say Porsche or Porsche, but then you went the whole episode and said Porsche. <laughs> you could have just told me Porsche. And <laughs> no, but this is the thing. This is part of the snootiness. If I tell you how to say it, and then I say it one way the entire time, now you know, and I didn't have to be a jerk and, and right. explain it to you. <laughs> I appreciate it. So now moving forward, I'm going to call it Porsche because you've called it Porsche, and now that's the right way to say it. I still slip every once in a while, so you're you're in the clear if you if you right. Don't. Yeah, Eric, do you say Porsche or Porsche? I I won't say either ever. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about never, Audi? Audi and I've Audi. never uttered the word um, Audi. Audi. Yeah. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No one no okay. one pronounces it another way. I was doing it Audi for a long time, um, and then I yeah. bought a Subaru. They wouldn't <laughs> sell me one. <laughs> I tried to get a Subaru one. Facebook group. <laughs> you know what? Some people I say I have a Subaru. Mom. Some people are very involved with, like, they think Subarus are like the shit. I told someone I had a Subaru the other day, one of my new clients, um, and he was, holy shit, you have a Subaru? I was like, yeah. Like, not, I thought it was like a Toyota. <laughs> I, I know nothing about cars. And he was like thrilled. I mean, I went in and wow. told him it was a Forester. It wasn't like one of those souped up uh, need for speed or <laughs> fast and the furious ones. But uh, yeah, there, I mean, you can find an enthusiast in, in anything, mm. even your Honda Civic, Eric. Mm -hmm. I don't have a Honda Civic. Oh, well, I thought you did. <laughs> no. Sorry. That was Sorry. just the example I used earlier. <laughs> okay. I thought you still had that Honda. That you yeah. picked me up in in Beverly Hills. No, that was a that was a BMW. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> looked kind of looked like a Honda. Sorry, Matt. No, how many Porsches you, you do you have? have? Uh, I just, goggles. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one. I got one uh, that was like an air cooled '86, and sold that one and upgraded to a 2007. Uh, but it's it's the only space I have. I can only fill. You know, when you get married, you have placeholders in your life. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. whether it's a watch or a boat or a car uh, or whatever, you got to hold that spot for as long as you can. Because as <laughs> soon as that spot is not filled, some other things will start filling that spot. So, yeah, just one oh, at a time. Shit. That's all I'm allowed at this point. So, just one? Just you need one. a bigger house. You got a, <laughs> a triple car garage. And I, I mean, two. all of these like Zillow finds and stuff were like the, you know, 10 car. Uh, garage and like thousand square foot house. I'm like that. 
my like target demo right here. That's all me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Matt, we've asked this question on the podcast before, but as a P word uh, enthusiast, <laughs> if you if you're a realtor, does it matter what sort of car you roll up to in the listing appointment? I think it depends. It depends on your client. Because to me, I want someone, like if I'm hiring an attorney to represent me in court, I want to see them in the best and brightest and newest whatever. Because my guess is, and this is not always true, so caveat, not everyone that has a nice car has money. <laughs> yeah. If they buy them cash, you know, if they can afford to, to lease them or whatever they decide to do, I'm not critical of that. But to me, I want someone that's going to perform at a high level. And so that's how you sell to me. Um, and I do not want the person rolling up in a Honda Civic with one missing hubcap. I want to see someone that's taking care of their stuff as well. So it really depends on your client. Um, I'm sure there are people, they'll never admit to it, but I'm sure there's people out there that do not use me or would never use me because of the car that I drive. And you know what? I'm okay with that. That's okay. I'm fine with that. Um, yeah. cause just like any other passion, if it's not a common denominator, if it's not a common theme or an ability for like me to build some rapport, I don't, I don't want to waste my time. Isn't that funny how we're kind of wired like that though? Cause a car really doesn't or shouldn't like tell how much someone would make. I mean, like what if you needed an investor for your business and Warren Buffett strolled in and his 2008 Cadillac and you didn't know it was Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to think, Oh, you know, what's going on here. And then the, the flashy, the flashy guy comes in his, you know, Eric's BMW or whatever. Like, it's just like, it's just like misconceptions of, mm -hmm. I'm sure Gary V doesn't drive like a, he probably drives like a Tesla. He's got a driver. Yeah. He probably doesn't even drive. Yeah. But again, like he's never in a suit. He's in his, his toque, things toque? like that. Like, yeah. He's like, where's a toque a lot. What's a toque? <laughs> Are you Never heard that before. Are you, you mean insane? a beanie? <laughs> This has got to be some uh, a Canadian term. Have it's you heard a Canadian. this? Yeah, it's Canadian. Okay, yeah, yeah. two. But but you 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 get so disgusted to the point you do this all the time <laughs> with Canadian things. I told him I was going to a cottage. He goes, "What the hell's a cottage? I've never heard of a cottage." You well, mean an Airbnb? But when you say cottage, I think like the Bernstein Bears are in there, like making porridge <laughs> right. or something. Well, like I that. showed it's you where cabin. I was. I it texted you where I was. Like, yeah, it kind of looked like that. Actually, looked like last house on the left. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was. It was not right. Uh, yeah, but, it looked like um, a survival bunker <laughs> from The Last of Us. <laughs> but I, I absolutely agree um, with you, Matt. With like, it, it depends on the client. Mm -hmm. You know, I like I always use the example. I, I bought a buyers a two point three million dollar house in in that Kia Forte, Eric. That that mm -hmm. had no rims. Yeah, that thing um, didn't even drive forwards. You had to drive that thing backwards. Yeah, that thing was. That thing you had was to drive insane. it in reverse the entire time. <laughs> that, thing, that thing was not right. It wasn't safe for me to be driving that. It wasn't yeah. safe for anyone on the road. Uh, but I got it done, and they didn't give a shit because yeah. they drove similar cars and they were rich. So you had to literally drive it like this, <laughs> <laughs> just the other way, <laughs> driving it backwards. Yeah. yeah, and then sometimes, yeah, it just. I guess it all depends on the client. What I will say is if you can't afford a nice car, don't like put yourself into debt to get a nice car or a nice watch or a nice whatever. It'll come. Don't feel pressured to get that. You'll still find the people you need to find to get the business. You can get those things along the way. Absolutely. I great. think that's yes. a, a, a good way to end. I'm getting better at ending these things. That was a great way. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. But before we do, Matt, where can the people find you? Yeah, um, I'm probably most active on Instagram. Uh, so at Matt period LaMarche, L-A-M-A-R-S-H. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate you guys having me. Of course, I've followed you both for years. So I really appreciate it and uh, love what you're doing. Actually, Matt, no, you don't. <laughs> no, I, uh, I did. About I used five to. hours no, before no, the podcast. No. I knew this was going to come up. Not I knew this following was going to come up. <laughs> me. Okay. So here's not that the I thing. care, just that statement. No, 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 no. Lies. No, no, blatant lies. <laughs> no blatant lies. I believe in full transparency here. So I he, have an assistant <laughs> that goes, and I don't know, You could. I should probably ask you this. Least interacted with, should I be removing those people? Mm. Either way, it's insulting. So <laughs> well, I agree. I don't. I don't discount that one. 
<laughs> no, I don't care. I'm just, I'm just messing with you. But you know, now that we are, you know, recently followed, my stuff will be popping up in your feed, and I'll be looking for those comments and likes. Matt, I don't nope. blame you. Uh, <laughs> once I get my first Porsche, Eric's my first unfollow. <laughs> <laughs> it all over myself. Um, well, Matt, you know, can't tell you I missed you when you unfollowed me. But uh, it's good to have you back. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Much. <laughs> He's winning them back, folks. It's good to have all right. you back. Thank you so much for being on, Matt. We appreciate it. I appreciate Everyone, it. Everyone, y'all take care now.